So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Has everybody found a seat? The curtains are closed, the lights are dimming. It means we're starting. We're actually starting on time, which I think is a miracle for any event here in Brussels. But I think it's important also for our live stream audience who is going to be joining us from wherever they are around Europe. So it's great. We've not got, just got the people here in the room, but we've got people elsewhere. So hello to you and hello to you. So on behalf of BAM and the One Planet Network, I'd like to welcome you all here this morning. My name is Cathy Smith. I'm going to be the moderator asking questions. The most important question you probably have, unless you've managed to see already, is the Wi-Fi code. Have you, has everyone got it? Because you need to have binoculars to see the, the, the notices we have here. So it's um, Bell with a capital B, B-E-L, event. Is the, is, uh, you go to there, and then the password, this is the key, is capital B-E-L, 190918. So it's capital B E L 190918. I think most people have you all got it because it's very important. It's there. It's there. Fine. Very important. So as you know, we're talking about circularity in the built environment, which in itself sounds a bit complex. It is quite complex, but it's very exciting. I mean, the whole idea that a building can become a, a, a bank for materials. I was just looking at this building, and apparently this building was actually built with an idea that it could have another life. And you can sort of see there that instead of being welded, it's all bolted together so it could actually be dismantled and changed and put to different uses. So it's all very exciting. There are the tools, and we're going to hear about that today, that it is all possible, but how to mainstream it, how to scale it up. And we want to find out today what's happening, just, not just here in Europe, but elsewhere in the world, uh, because if this is going to be a, a big movement, it's got to be global. Um, we also want you to talk about this, so we need you to tweet. If you are a member of the Twitterati, you, the hashtag is building circular, hashtag building circular. So, uh, we really, really want to get, make a lot of noise out there in the Twitter sphere. Very important now, I'm going to talk to you about Slido. I don't know if people have been at other conferences where you've, we, you've used the Slido app. We need you to open this. You don't need to download this app, but you need to go onto your smartphones, and it's slido.com. Is this also here? I think maybe we're going to have a slide, but it's slido.com. And the event is hashtag building circular, the same as the, as the Twitter. So it's slido.com, and then the event is building circular. Now this is, the reason it's important is because we're going to use this app to, for you to ask questions, but also for us to ask you questions. So we want to have lots of kind of conversation going on via Slido. We do also have good old-fashioned technology of microphones that we can, uh, you can actually talk. But um, the Slido enables us to really get some sort of sense of what you're thinking and feeling and also for people to ask questions. I think also, as we're talking in English all day, it's so much easier to write a question sometimes rather than stand up with a microphone. So uh, are you all on there? Slido.com, building circular, because the time has come that we're going to actually test it. Um, we have got some initial uh, Slido questions. Do we have them? Are you seeing the question yet on... I, I've not got my... No, no, here we are. So, construction and demolition um, waste and building manufacturers generate how much of the EU's total controlled waste? Is it 14%, 27%, um, 33% or 45%? Huh. Well, 60%. Oh, it's moving around. So, oh, half and half. Whoa! It's moving. Okay. You've probably guessed correctly, knowing the theme of the conference, but basically you say that 53%, say 45%. That is correct, that, that basically construction demolition waste is number one in terms of the controlled waste in the EU. So it's pretty, pretty high. Let's have a look at a second Slido question. So according to the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which sector has the largest potential in terms of mitigated, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions at the lowest cost? Is it agriculture? Is it building? Is it mining? Or is it the hospitality sector? Well. 
if you didn't get this right, there's no point in you being here because I think you all know how very important this whole subject is. But anyway, yes, 87%. So there you are. That's just a really just a little teaser to test Slido. You seem to um, have all managed to get it onto your, uh, onto your smartphones, and so we're ready to go because there'll be many slightly more complex questions coming as we carry on. So I really now want to introduce to you um, your real host today. And first of all, Molly Steinlager, who is the BAM project coordinator. Um, so BAM, B materials, uh, buildings as materials bank. I think you all know what it means from Brussels Environment. Hi, Molly. So do you want to take a seat? And Pekka Hovila, who is the coordinator of the Sustainable Buildings and Construction Program with the One Planet Network. Hi, Pekka. So basically, our two hosts. And I just want to find out a little bit more about um, what's going to happen today and a little bit more about your organization. So Molly, t I mean, a lot of people, of course, are familiar with the work of BAM. But just before we talk about that, what, how do you react to these, these numbers? I mean, for, from somebody not in the sector, 45% is a really high number, isn't it, in terms of construction and demolition waste? Um, yeah, indeed, it is a very high number, but in fact, that's not the only significant environmental impact. Uh, we also can attribute 50% of extracted resources to the sector, as well as 40% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. So combined, that's just an absolutely huge environmental impact. And so if we want to have a sustainable future, we really need to move towards a circular economy. Hence, this, the establishment of BAM. Exactly. That's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to change the world, and we're trying to make a systemic shift towards a circular economy in the building sector. Right, so tell us, for anyone who doesn't know exactly what BAM is, tell us what it is. Why? So BAM is an abbreviation for Buildings as Material Banks, and it's an EU-funded Horizon 2020 project. Uh, we're bringing together 15 partners from seven different countries all across Europe, and we're working towards that goal of a systemic shift in the building sector. And so, yeah, you're working towards a shift. So what are your objectives then? Yeah, so of course, one of our key objectives is eliminating waste. We want to foster reuse, transformation, and high-grade um, upcycling of buildings, their products, and materials. And just to give you an example, um, at, the, at the start of the project, we were ambitious, but maybe not ambitious enough, and we had the hope of decreasing construction waste in our pilot projects by 30 to 50 percent. And actually, we've seen through prototyping and implementation at this stage in the project that through the use of the BAM reversible building design guidelines and tools, we'll actually exceed that goal and eliminate as much as 75 to even 90 percent of waste in the pilots. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's it? incredible. We're uh, going to change the world. Excellent. <laughs> I, like, I like your ambition. So how have you done it? I mean, basically, you've, you've developed various tools, which we're going to hear quite a lot about today. Yeah, indeed. So concretely, what are we doing? Well, we're, we're developing and integrating a series of different tools. Um, some of the, the pillars of the, the project are materials passports, reversible building design, as well as circular building assessment tools. And then in addition to that, those are further supported by new business models, policy propositions, and decision-making models. And then going one step further, as I already mentioned, we're testing and demonstrating the utility of those tools and their potential in real-scale pilot projects across Europe. And this, the type of project and the size of them um, varies quite a bit. So for example, we have a large new um, office building that's being developed or has actually already been completed in Germany. Uh, we have a rather ambitious renovation and repurposing project in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we also have a traveling showroom that's going around Europe raising awareness about BAM and the potential of reversible building and materials passports. So, you, well, you already said that you plan to change the world, but do, do you, re you really think you've achieved something? Because this, this project is actually coming to an end of its first phase. I presume you're hoping that there will be more to come. Yeah, I really do think that we have already achieved quite a lot. We still have... Um, more to do in this last quarter of the project. So we started in September of 2015, and the project will come to an end in February of 2019. So we have a little bit left to go, so just under six months. Uh, but we already actually have half of our outputs completed, and in this last, in this last push, we're going to finish all of the others. And so I'd say that we really have already ch achieved quite a lot in that short amount of time. Great. Well, so Pekka, now tell us about the One Planet Network, because we're going beyond Europe now. Tell us a little bit about it. 
We are the implementing implementation platform, the 10 year framework of programs on sustainable consumption and production. And we have a global commit commitment to accelerate the shift towards sustainable consumption practice in developing countries and in developed world. And we have also a global mandate that has been stated in the agenda 2030 in SDG 12, precisely target 12.1. So we are operating in this uh, at a global scale. Can you just put the microphone a little bit closer? It's, it's, uh, is the sound okay? Are you, are you hearing? Yeah. Um, and you've got six programs, but I know that we're just going to hear mainly about three today. Yes, we have buildings and construction, uh, procurement and tourism here today. In addition to these three, we have also um, lifestyles and education, consumer information and food systems. And all these six programs, they have also very common, uh, let's say, core towards this built environment that is a common denominator here. Each of these programs, they also have a quite large uh, stakeholder community on governments, industry, uh, civil society, intergovernmental organizations, and academia. So it's quite large network that we bring together. And in addition to those, we have also partners. And as an example, BAMB is one of the partners of the buildings and construction program. And we are still running until 2022. So there's a possibility to join us in this global movement. And that's the thing, isn't it, that you're still running. So what are your main objectives then for the rest of the program? Well, each program has defined their own priorities in their sec sector. But after having run now five years, we are now halfway in this 10 YFP, we have identified the circular economy as our common core. So all six programs are looking at what circularity means in their sector. It's not only environmentally, but it's also having, let's say, economical models, how that can be done in a viable way. And, and when we talk about the Global South, also the informal sector can be formalized through this operationalization of circularity. So what, how do you then operate? We've heard about the projects, the pilot projects that BAM's doing. What sort of activities are you involved in? Well, mainly we also develop a knowledge base that can be then disseminated across different constituencies. We also share good practices. We develop implementation projects. As an example, in our buildings and construction project, we have initiated five projects in eight countries where we are doing these things in practice. We also raise awareness in different events. We develop videos, podcasts, and organize events like that. We have done with, together with BAMBA and also other programs, a couple of those before. So we also operate inter program -led. So Molly, the, as we said, you're, you're coming to an end, but um, you, I mean, we talked that you already have a partnership with One Planet Network, but I mean, where do you go from here then in terms of building up more partnerships and trying to kind of spread the word, if you like? Yeah, so actually the BAM um, consortium is already reaching out to partners of like One Planet Network and, and others as well. And what we're, what we're really hoping at this point in our project as we're coming to a close is we really want to raise awareness about the BAM project, make sure that everybody's aware in the sector of what we've been doing, what we've been achieving, and we want to make sure that the tools that we're developing or have already developed are going to be used in the EU and beyond. And the way that we're hoping to do that is through those partnerships, through raising awareness, and through uh, the partnership like we've developed with the One Planet Network and the exciting program and the event that we've developed for you today. So tell us more about that then. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, today we have the event basically can be broken down into four parts. So first, uh, my colleagues from the BAM Consortium are going to present to you some of our key tools that we've developed in relation to the topics of the day, so digitalization, public procurement, and circular building assessment. And then we're gonna give the word to the One Planet Network team, and they're going to share more about some of their initiatives, what's already been happening. Uh, also look at how the BAM project can maybe be utilized outside of Europe, and also how can Europe land, learn from things that are already happening elsewhere around the globe. Um, we're then going to dive into the question of what's next, because we are the BAM project is a good example of an initiative that is already taking place. The One Planet um, Network also has good examples of initiatives that are already taking place. But all of the solutions aren't there yet. So we want to ask what's next? How do we go forward to really make circularity possible? And we're going to do that through parallel sessions. We're going to have five different parallel sessions have been proposed so that we can dive into some specific questions. Three of those different uh, sessions have been proposed by the BAM team, and we're looking at the topics of materials, passports, and their potential for circularity and health. Uh, we want to dive deeper into the, the new tool that we've developed on circular building assessment. Uh, and then we want to actually question what's after digitalization. And then, Pekka, maybe you can share on the... 
Yes, we are happy, very happy to bring, because we see that Europe is actually in a, like a leading position in the circularity in the built environment. And in this plenary session, we have one parallel thing on the public procurement led by our Dutch partners, and they are like, we find us, that, let's say, leaders in this domain. That will be very interesting because they will share concrete cases on circular buildings, how they have been designed, how they are constructed, and which are the benefits for different stakeholders. And the other one, it's about tourism sector. They have also identified the circularity as an important uh, feature for them doing successfully sustainable tourism. So both of them will be run by us. And we have also already earlier collaborated with tourism uh, in, in these things. We see that uh, the built environment is in the core when you want to develop these activities in a sustainable way. And then the very last part of the day will be um, coming back together and sharing the key messages that have come out of the different sessions so that if you didn't get to follow one of the other sessions but you're also interested, you can learn some of the key things that have come out of that session as well. So we're going to get the audience very busy. Um, there will be more people, no doubt, joining us as time goes on. But so, w w I mean, where, what do you want to kind of achieve by this day? Uh, so from the BAM perspective, our goal is really to raise awareness, share knowledge, and learn today. And I think that we'll definitely achieve that. Um, I'm actually quite excited to see that throughout the registration process, uh, we've already had quite a good demand for the event, both in terms of numbers, but we've also seen that uh, it's, it's really interesting to see that we have so many uh, people who are beyond the BAM stakeholder network. So some new faces in the room, as well as being able to reach so many people via um, live streaming. So I think that we'll definitely be able to achieve our goal of raising awareness of what's happening and what we still need to do to achieve our goals. And Pekka, what about you? Our expectations are very high here to learn better what BAM has done, and we will know more about that in next session and see if we can somehow help in disseminating these things across the world and also try to bring in things here. But it's not only BAM and one plant network also want to interact with the audience. This group of experts being here present today, we want also to interact with you and, and see how the things could be then have a positive change. Great. Well, thank you both very much indeed. That gives us a good introduction to what we're going to expect for the rest of the day. So thank you. And I meant to say to the live stream audience that when we were talking about Slido, that everybody, anybody watching from elsewhere can also join in with the, uh, the asking questions or answering questions on Slido. So I don't want anyone watching this to think they can just sit there and not do anything. Um, we're now starting with the session where we all the rest of the morning we're going to be looking at at the BAM project and really sort of picking to, picking it apart, if you like, uh, to really get a sense of what's been going on and what will go on in the future. So um, we're talking to, to begin with buildings as material banks. How BAM is enabling circularity in the construction sector through digitalization, a key key word will digitalization actually empower us to reach the vision of BAM. Um, so we're going to get a kind of an overview of all the BAM tools um, and get a discussion about the, the road ahead. And to help us with this, Jan Bostrom, Chief Technology Officer of Sunderhus, a Swedish company based in Linköping, Jan, I think. And you're a consultant to the construction sector, advising on environmental aspects of different materials. But you've been working particularly, I think, on, on the material passports and circular building assessment, so two things. Yes, that's correct. Now, before you do your presentation, we obviously have to get them working, so we have to ask some Slido questions. So could we have the next Slido uh, question? So and get that up. OK. So in your experience, who typically decides which construction products are actually bought and used? Is it the real estate developer? Is it the building owner? Is it the construction engineer? Is it the purchaser or is it the contractor? Whoa. I mean, I'm, there probably isn't a right answer to this, but I'll ask Jan what he thinks in a moment. It's a bit of a cop-out, the first one, isn't it? Each building project is different and involves one or more different decision makers, but that's what... 42% of you are saying so far. So what do you reckon, Jan? Is, does that surprise you? Is there a right answer? It doesn't surprise me at all, actually. 
And I think that's the point for the question. I, I don't think there is a right answer to this, since, well, maybe the one at the top there. But in reality, it seems to be like that, that decisions are made everywhere by different people. There are some doing more decisions, of course, in this. But anyone almost involved in the construction process will make decisions about what products to choose. It might not be ideal, but I think that's the way it is. Just keep yeah. the microphone very close. It's a very sensitive microphone. So, Okay, let's go on to our next Snyder question, which is um, how many different construction products make up an ordinary office building? And here we're not talking about individual nails, but types of nails, for instance. How many different construction products make up an ordinary office building? Is it more than 10,000, between 100 and 1,000? Between, uh, uh, oh, it's skipping around now. Or well, maybe you don't know. Well, everyone can have a guess. Oh, no, 2% don't know. 46%. Okay, let's go. it's going high on between 1,000 and 10,000, which is already quite a big spread. What's, yeah. what's your answer? Is there an answer? <laughs> well, the answer, we really don't know. I, I can't give you an exact figure. Of course, it's different from every different project. But... Um, I think that uh, around 10,000, depending on the type of project. And uh, since all those things actually have a specific function and might have to be considered when you do a circular building. They might have to be considered, but, but would you mainly can, can home in on the big things rather than the small things? If you're talking about circularity, does it make sense to just look at the larger aspects? Definitely. But when you get into, say, things like uh, reversible building design, the small components might also have a large influence on how reversible something is. So, but of course, you probably start at the things that are the large quantity products. Okay, let's have a look at Slido question three. Um, when buildings are actually used as material banks, somebody needs to decide uh, is this the one? Yes. Uh, the, the extraction of building components needs to be considered. These products can be remanufactured and reused for other applications. Who would make these decisions? So when the, you're using a building as a material bank, you're talking about extracting components. Who would make the decisions? Would it be manufacturers, building professionals, end users, building owners, or a combination of the above? So it seems to be going into a combination again. Um, what do you think? It d I mean, it depends on lots of things, probably. Definitely. And, yeah, I think that's sort of, for, for all these questions, it's a combination, really. And it's, uh, there are different aspects coming into this. But, of course, you will have to consider who's actually owning the stuff that you really want to do something with and who knows how to do, what to do with it, really. And all these things has to come together in the decision. So, yeah. This well, is and what just I shows expect, how, really. yes, I mean, it shows how everybody's got to come on board with this whole concept. So, Jan, let's uh, leave you to make your presentation and, and then you. we can ask questions later. Thank you. Yes. The construction industry uses well, approximately 50% of all raw materials consumed. And when something goes into a building, it doesn't just vanish. It's still there. But it loses its value significantly the moment it's actually installed. It will fill its function in that building, but when that comes to an end, we really can't hope for more than it being reclaimed at... Uh, a very low value compared to what it originally had. And that is not good enough. It's not good for the economy and not for the people owning the building, and it's not good for the environment. So we need to, oh, sorry. <laughs> Slide on. So we need to do something about this. We want buildings, to put it very simply, to be designed in a better way. 
enabling us to reuse them and what they are made of to the same or even a higher value than they originally had. I.e., we want buildings to be designed in a more circular way. BAM tries to address this in two major ways. It's a bit complex image here, but one is reversible building design. How to design a building so that it can be adjusted to different demands with as little waste and effort as possible. And this applies both to the building's design and features, as well as to how the components that it consists of are designed and put together. And two, materials passport. In-depth information about construction products, circular aspects that will enable future reuse, repurposing, and reclamation of those products. These two concepts are then forming part of the basis for what we call circular building assessment, a methodology for assessing how circular a specific building design is. Right now, we're developing a proof of concept uh, software tool that incorporates parts of that assessment methodology. But it also makes us enables us to create circular business models that will enable product service providers to create added value all across the value network. And experience from creating these tools, as well as testing them in the pilot projects, helps us do policy recommendations, including on key topics like procurement, you will hear a lot of these things in the other sessions, so I won't go into any more details here. But there are some conclusions that we've drawn from this. And they are nice, actually. It is possible. Yeah. It is possible to design buildings in a more circular way. It's even technically feasible to do that. And it's actually being done. It can be done, and it's being done in the pilots we're right now running. We also found that most, but not all, of the decisions that has to be done through the construction process are when taken one by one, rather straightforward, if you have the knowledge and access to the information needed. So then, everything is fine, right? Well, no, of course not. So even though we right now know how to design buildings in a more circular way, that won't make any significant difference unless we manage to scale it up a lot. So that is what we're looking at now. We really don't want just a few pilot projects or some prestige projects, that's nice, but what we want to achieve is to make this way to design buildings the norm, not the exception. When we want to design a building in a more circular way, we'll have to make a lot of new decisions based on new types of information all along the design and construction process. And sure, actually, when you do a normal design and construction process, you also have to make a lot of decisions. So that's nothing new. The difference is that there you have years of experience, years of well, tradition, actually, you have regulations, you have all these things that will help you. And you also have recently well-defined sets of information that everyone knows has to be available for the decision maker to make these decisions. So, digitalization will not automatically solve this. You know, I, I actually worked with digitalization for a large part of my professional life, even before I got to know that tongue-wrenching word there. So, and I really love the stuff. I mean, could there be something more fun than data schemas, standardizing information, organizing it, processing it, trying to get conclusions out of it? I mean, it's great fun. Well, yeah, I'm a bit weird, but uh, that's okay. Uh, but I also found something else that's rather weird, I think. You know, I found this strange notion that as soon as you make something digital and you put it into a computer, or even better, you put it into the cloud, and then you just apply some of the nice terms that are currently floating around, 
like, well, IoT, BIM, SAS, VDC, AI, microservices, and don't forget the current one, the most popular one at the moment, blockchain. If you just apply that, then everything is going to automatically sort of solve itself. Well, I don't think so. These things are very nice in the right context, but they're not the solution. What they might be are required enablers for the solution. So what we need to do is actually to turn it around. Forget about these things at the moment and then go to the goal. What do we want to achieve? We want the majority of buildings to be designed in a more circular way, increasing value and reducing waste. So question number two, do we know how to do that? And yes, within BAM we know that. We have developed a number of guide, uh, guides, recommendations, tools, really, to help you to design buildings in a more circular way than is currently the norm. Sure, there are more things to do here, definitely, but what we currently have would make a huge difference. So then the third question would be, if we want to make this the norm, what would be the practical obstacles to do this? And I would say the two, well, three actually I have, obstacles would primarily be knowledge, of course. You need to know how to do this. Second, access to the relevant information. And there's a third one, I won't go into it that much here, but it's market incentives. So what we need to do is figure out how to get past these things. We need to enable or empower all these people that are making all these decisions through the design and the construction process to take into consideration their circular aspects of the decisions as well as all the other things they're already considering. And that goes for architects, uh, construction engineers, but in the end, from the Slido checks there, I think it actually goes for anyone that's involved in the process, since decisions are made everywhere. So, what we need to do is to get a lot of new information from different sources for a lot of products available. We then have to filter this information, process it to create, well, actually make it to information. In the beginning, it's data there, I'd say. So it has to be converted to something that provides insights to those people making the decisions so they can make better decisions. In this way, we provide decision support. We're not really automatically making the decisions for people, but we're helping them to make more informed decisions. An example of that could be what we're doing in the CBA, where we actually enables you to upload a specific design, and then you can run it through an assessment, and you might get a score of 7.6 for one of the indicators, say reversibility, and then you do a modification on the design, and you change some stuff, and you run it again, and hopefully you might get 8.6 then next time. You have a chance to see that from a circular perspective, this new design is actually a better one. And that is what we could do. We could actually help people to compare different options, help them in their work to consider these things too. And that is something that digitalization definitely can help us with. Actually, I would say that if we don't use digitalization here, we won't be able to do this. Not in a scale that will make any difference. So we're sort of required to do it. So, to summarize this, I wouldn't say that digitalization will automatically make us reach BAM's vision but it will empower the construction industry professionals so that they can reach BAMS vision. However, we're still missing a lot of data to create good, useful information from, and that's where you can help us. Um, 
in the parallel session this afternoon on what's after digitalization. You can tell us what information you need to make proper decisions and where we might find that information. So see you then for an interesting discussion and thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jan. So um, it's not rocket science, it says, but obviously the, the, the whole... Yes, you're staying with us for the dis discussion. So the, the, the whole challenge is scaling up. Um, just to remind you that you can already start sending in questions for Jan. Uh, we're going to have a question and answer session after our first three speakers. So on Slido, you can send any questions that you have for Jan. Let me just take my iPad so I can have a look as questions come in. So we have already heard mention of the circular building assessment, a BAM tool, and we're now going to hear a lot more about it from Jilly Hobbs, who is from the Building Research Establishment in the UK, but working, Jilly, not just in the UK, um, but internationally, you'll need a microphone. Thank you. And um, you're a BAM coordinator, of course, so shall we have a look at some Slido questions that are going to start off your session? Yes, please. So which of these examples do you think best demonstrates circular building practices? An adaptable building that can be easily converted for different uses, one that's using a high percentage of recycled materials, designing a building with reversible connections, easier to take apart, leasing a carpet instead of buying it, or reusing products and materials from a previous building on the same site. So that we're heading towards 39%, an adaptable building that can be easily converted for different uses. What do you say to that, Jilly? Well, I didn't actually give people a cop-out for this one, so you had to choose one thing. Um, and that's interesting. I'm sure if I was doing this, I'd be thinking, well, it's all of these, or it could be all of these. Um, and, uh, but I wanted to just get an idea from the audience in terms of when you think about circular building, you know, which of these sort of most resonates. And, um, and yeah, I think it's really good, actually, to see that the adaptable building is coming up very high, along with designing for reversible connections, because a lot of the work that we've been doing is not just looking at existing buildings, but also, you know, very much focused on the future and how do you create this future uh, buildings as material banks. So... That's really, it's really interesting, actually. So it's Carry very on much, voting, please. It's very much sort of the, the design phase rather than, rather than uh, older buildings, but interesting, yeah. Yeah, so Shall there's no right answer, I have to say. It's just your opinion, and, uh, and I just think it's quite interesting that people are looking quite forward with this. Let's so have really a look good. at the second Slido question, then, that you suggested. What is most likely to influence you in relation to building design and specification choices? Is it capital cost, operational cost? value creation and retention, design quality, or environmental, um, where's that one gone? Environmental impact reduction. So what's likely to influence you in relation to building design and specification? So environmental is pr pretty high. Health and well-being. Funny enough, value creation retention was quite high. It's now kind of slipping back, and environment is... What do you reckon to this, Jilly? I'm actually quite surprised, to be honest. Yeah, I am, I actually. am surprised, because, um, you know, using that as environmental impact reduction as a driver, um, I found that it's quite often to use that by itself as, the, as a reason to do something differently. Um, you know, quite often you have to sort of make a more of a business case. And I'm not suggesting you can't make a business case in terms of environmental reduction in itself and health and well-being can have some, you know, some real significant value-added benefits associated with it. But yeah, I am surprised actually that that's reached. It's very good actually. It's quite it nice to see it that is. people care about the environment. I have for... You know, all my adult life, pretty much. Well, we certainly so. can't disapprove of that. Well, l listen, l let's leave you to your uh, presentation now, telling us more about the circular building assessment. Right, so I'm not sure whether to go here or here, but I'll stay here for the time being. Um, hopefully there isn't too much echo in, the, um, in this mic. So, um, 
So Jan, thank you for giving a nice introduction to circular building assessment, and Cathy, of course. Um, so I work at BRE, Building Research Establishment in the UK, and we've actually been working for many years in the whole area of um, optimizing resource use in the built environment. And we're really happy to get involved with the BAM project because it was sort of taking us to the next stage of our development, which is, okay, circular economy, people are talking about it. Actually, how do we actually get to um, making it a reality? And we focus very much on the, um, the actual ability to influence and help decision-making in the whole process. And, and the circular building assessment is very much, that's the raison d'etre of, um, of why we created it, was to, to give this support um, across a sort of very evolving um, design and construction process. So I'm going to go into that in a bit more detail, but just to just cover some of the areas, we're going to, I'm going to basically tell you what is, or try to explain what the circular building assessment is and what we've done to create it, um, how we think it's going to be used um, within the, the built environment, but then also what's happening next in terms of our development. Um, but first of all, I mean, one of those Slido questions, which we'll just get a feel is to, in terms of, you know, when people think about circular economy or circular building, actually lots of people are coming at it from different perspectives. They've got different definitions or understanding what it means. So we've really sort of fixed on, in terms of doing the circular building assessment, we've fixed on these three core scenarios. Um, and also these three sort of building or asset lifetimes. So the first one is what have we already got. So we have, you know, the vast majority of the built environment for the next 50 years already been built. So how do we optimize the resources that are already captured within that built environment? And that's actually pretty much where a lot of the work so far is focused in terms of resource efficiency is how do you do best recycling, for example. But we're actually, in terms of what we're focusing on, it's like how do you extract the materials and the products from the previous built environment and use it in this sort of current built environment that we're trying to create at the moment, and, um, and it's very much about displacing new products and materials. So the middle one is about the current building. So obviously this is where a lot of the focus is happening in terms of we're designing, we're um, making business cases for new buildings, new assets, and so what could be really be done at this stage? Um, and for this, we're focusing on how do you sort of embed transformation adaptability into that design? But then we're also looking ahead to the third scenario, which is what, how do we incorporate this future reuse potential so that if the building or the asset does become redundant in the future, you can actually easily, easily take it apart and use it to create the next, um, the next built environment effectively. So your buildings as material banks. Um, and... The other sort of core objective was really to have something that was obviously easy to use, but in recognition of the fact that actually you, you start off with, um, if you do designing, you're starting off with probably quite little information. But to do things like an environmental economic assessment, you need a lot of data. So how do we, how do we create a system whereby you can move through this sort of design process from sort of concept, early design through to detailed design, all the way through to in use and then eventually end of life. How do you create something that can help at all those different stages of the design, construction, and in, in use process? So, um, so we think we've cracked that to a certain extent um, in terms of having the ability to do a very early stage assessment process where the impacts of certain design decisions, for example, are, are greatest. And then that can then go through to a more detailed design where you know, you're looking at other types of decision making where you've got more, de more data, more detail, and you can then evolve your assessment and your decision making process. And the other important aspect is that um, the, the things that make up a building or an asset last different, you know, they last for different lengths of time. So you've got the, you know, the, you've got the products that are staying for the whole building life. So how do you sort of assess impacts of doing things differently with those versus things that are replaced at maybe 10, 15 years throughout a building's life, and then you've got things that are replaced much more frequently than that. So how can an assessment process deal with all those different scenarios and different levels of detail? 
So this is quite complicated to look at, so I'm not expecting everybody to, I haven't got time in fact, I'm waiting for my five minute thing to come up any second now. Um, and uh, it's quite complicated, but actually two of, the, two of the areas we're going to talk about in more detail later, so reversible building design and material passports. So they're you know, really core cool, uh, elements of this overarching system. So it's basically the, the left-hand side is really about the assessment process. So we're doing an environmental assessment, looking at economic assessment, and we're doing some social value, understanding of social value. And then the, the right-hand side is, well, okay, who's going to provide the data? Who's going to go through this process, assessment process? So we're creating a user interface, but actually we're trying to make it so the user doesn't have to sit there for the rest of the month plugging in data that they can build upon these existing databases such as building information, model data, and material passport data. And then the bit in the middle is our user interface. So this is the thing that guides you through the, um, the circular building assessment process and helps you map different scenarios and understand the impact of doing things a bit differently. So um, this is just one element of it, the environmental assessment. So we did build it upon um, sort of current standards in terms of life cycle assessment. But what we're trying to do is to report um, information back in a way that's helpful to making certain um, circular building scenarios that I've outlined earlier. So in this example, for example, it's um, you know, what was the impact of using the reclaimed bricks? This is BRE's environmental building. It's a 20-year-old circular building um, pilot. It's still up, which is good. Um, and but one of the things is we use reclaimed bricks. So what was actually the environmental impact of, of using those reclaimed bricks from the previous built environment? Um, we've also looked at, uh, at connection types, so lime mortar, so that they can be reused again in the future. So what's the environmental impact of that? So we've done a calculation of that. If it's, it's quite transformable, the internal space is quite configurable, so that could extend the building life cycle in terms of it could last longer because you could use it for different, currently it's an office, but you know, it could be used for a lab or you know, potentially even turn into a hotel in the future, um, whatever. So it's expandable in terms of its lifetime. So what's the environmental benefit of extending a building life? And then the last area is, um, so reusable partitioning. So you have a partition that can be moved around. The alternative would be to have each time you wanted to change um, a room configuration, you'd have to take out the existing partitioning and put in new partitioning. So this is a really good example of um, what are the benefits of uh, reusing systems within the building life cycle as opposed to um, you know, having these replaceable uh, on a regular basis life cycle. So we've done all those assessments in a, in a manual sense, and we basically converted that into a, a virtual assessment process through the, the circular building assessment platform. And the economic assessment, I mean, again, it's a really critical aspect of, um, of doing this sort of uh, decision making, is to understand those, um, those critical areas of, you know, where you're actually spending your money, where you're getting the value. And this economic assessment um, shown here is, again, it's a partitioning system. So um, I'm not expecting you to be able to see this, but the blue line is basically the business as usual. Every time we need to change the partitioning, we'll rip it out, and we're on a regular basis. We'll, every 20 years, we'll rip out partitioning. We'll put in new partitioning versus a reusable system. So initially, as you would expect, the reusable system starts off having slightly more impact because it has to be more durable. But actually, after the first um, replacement cycle for the, auto, for the business as usual, you're starting to see some real economic benefits. So this is the sort of information that we want to make very visible and very obvious when you're doing your sort of scenario modeling effectively. So the other aspects of social assessment. So it's been very difficult to, to do this in a quantitative way, make it a virtual process, but we think it's really important to recognize that it's, um, you know, the third aspect of sustainability or resilience or, you know, having a, a better built environment. Um, and so we've created a methodology that can really pinpoint what are the, the costs and benefits of these three, you know, fundamental circular building scenarios, but also at these different levels of impact. So you've got the impact on the building user, 
you have the impact on the, the sort of surrounding community, and then you have the impact on society as a whole. So examples of that, I was woken up at half past six this morning by the sound of buildings being demolished in my immediate vicinity. So that had an impact on me because it woke me up. And the, the demolition process was quite a destructive demolition process. The alternative deconstruction process would be a lot quieter. We haven't measured it. That's something that could be measured. But, you know, there's a benefit already in terms of you're not having this, this um, impact on the local environment. So those are the sorts of things that we're trying to systematically go through in terms of you're doing things a bit differently. How can you quant qualify some of those benefits, those societal benefits? And what are we doing next? So we've... Um, so working with Jan and others, we've created the methodology. We're now turning that into um, this software solution. And it's a proof of concept. So we want to know whether or not you can bring different elements of the system, so the previous side, together and actually plug um, building information into it. And then you can get this very quick and easy assessments, multiple types of assessments out easily. So that's what we're going to be prototyping in about three weeks' time. So that's when it's, it's going to be ready. I'm confident it's going to be ready. So, um, so that's going to be quite exciting because we're going to spend the rest of, um, of the year pretty much testing the data extraction, the assessment process, working with the BAM pilots. But then also we've got a whole load of volunteer um, external pilots lined up that also want to go through this um, piloting and testing process with us. And just to finish up on, you know, what's the key message from this? So... We've actually, if you look at it, I'll show you the thing here. This is actually quite a complicated engine that is enabling this uh, circular building assessment to happen in a more automated and um, an integrated way, building on building information model data, for example, building on material passports, having to be a, the ability to make some assumptions in terms of reversibility of connections. There's a lot to the system. I think of it as like a jigsaw puzzle, and we've created the sort of core bits of the jigsaw puzzle, and the next stage of the next few weeks is to now stick the bits, the bits of those uh, system together and then start piloting it. And then this is actually, we want something more like this for the user to see. We want it to be very easy, user-friendly, and helping making those really important decisions um, at the point they need to be made. So thank you for listening. I hope... I have a quick plug for, I don't know if I have spaces, but quick plug for the parallel session this afternoon if you want to go in more detail about circular building assessment and how do we sort of roll it out and make it commonplace. Um, and I hope to see some of you there later. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jilly.